Frankie, when you got drafted by the Steelers in 1972, uh, there were rumblings on some different things beginning to happen with the Steelers, but they weren't a very good football team. Uh, and I wonder when you got drafted by the Steelers, what was your initial reaction? Well, like it surprises me because when you said rumblings, it sounded like positive rumbling. There was, posi <laughs> there was positive rumbling. There were building going. blocks in place. There were building blocks in place. Well, uh, at Penn State, I uh, really didn't follow the Steelers at all. And, uh, and I really wasn't thinking about being drafted by the Steelers. And I didn't want to be drafted by the Steelers. <laughs> uh, and so when I was drafted, I have to admit, it was pretty shocking because they were, they were one of the teams I didn't want to draft me. Uh, but what can you do? You know what I mean? So, it got, you know, I got drafted by the Steelers, and, and I put on a positive attitude and, uh, and, uh, and then got ready for training camp. When you arrived, I mentioned building blocks. Joe Green was here. Bradshaw was here the John Coles, the Jack Hams. Once you got to Pittsburgh, did you begin to see that, hey, maybe there's something happening here? Well, you know what, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm a rookie, and as I mentioned, I never followed Pittsburgh. Didn't know any of the people, didn't hear of any of the guys. I didn't know Bradshaw, Joe Green. I mean, all the people that would eventually become great stars. Uh, didn't hear anything about them. Uh, I really didn't read anything about any of the guys. Uh, so I and 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 like I guess I want to say, one of the things I did not know was their terrible history. <laughs> and I am so glad that I did not know how bad they were these first forty years. And, and not knowing that, I came in with a positive attitude. Now it's, you know how you just have different thoughts as a young kid, right? Because, you, you know, what do you know? And I'm, and I'm telling myself, and I don't know why I'm telling myself this, I was saying, man, it'd be great to go to the Super Bowl. It'd be great to go to a Super Bowl. Not knowing how bad they were and didn't know they were the worst rated team in the history of the NFL. And, uh, but I approached it like, uh, you know, anxious and, uh, and, and looking forward to it. A lot of your teammates, Hall of Famers, or just teammates in general, said that when Franco got here, he was the missing piece. Did you get that sense when you arrived? And looking back on it now, were you the missing piece? Uh, you know what, uh, when you first arrive, it's always tough to know the lay of the land, who's who, how are you going to fit in. Um, sometimes you kind of luck out. I think I lucked out when uh, their basic running scheme, I think, fit my running style perfectly. And, uh, and I had no expectations. Um, as a matter of fact, uh, you know, all of us are tested during certain times. Now, uh, I had a good preseason, which was a nice surprise for me, and, uh, and it made me feel uh, a little bit more comfortable in the position and in my ability on what I could do. Uh, but then the guys were telling me, well, Franco, preseason, regular season, two different seasons. I mean, two completely different attitudes, the level of violence, the, the level of, you know, just uh, the game is totally different. I'm saying, oh, it can't be that much different. So the first regular season game I had to start because of a running back being hurt. And against the Raiders, I was like a deer in headlights, man. I mean... The pace, the quickness, the hitting, 
totally different than preseason. And I didn't do well. And, uh, you know, the, you know, defensive guys talking to, oh, we're going to kill you, rookie. And, uh, you know, it's like, oh, my God. <laughs> you know, all that kind of stuff, right? And then the next game, I kind of fumbled, you know, and we lost a game, and now I'm in the doghouse. And I think the next game, uh, probably didn't didn't run the you know didn't even touch the ball, and and the next game, probably didn't touch the ball at all because I'm in the doghouse now. And but it's interesting because I, I kept telling myself, keep working hard, keep working hard, stay focused, Franco. Don't get down on yourself, even though Chuck and you know probably other coaches down on me. I said, don't get down on yourself. Right. I kept working. I stayed focused. And then it's interesting where, like, I made a statement to myself. I said, the next time they put me in, they'll never take me out. And in football, you know, that happens, right? Somebody got hurt during the Houston game. You know, Franco get in there. And that game got my first 100 yard, my first... NFL touchdown, and they didn't take me out after that. Lou Gehrig and Wally Pipp uh, all, all over again. Uh, you mentioned Chuck. I wondered if there were any parallels between playing for Chuck and Joe Paterno. Maybe something the way Joe handled things. Were there any similarities between those two coaching legends? Well, both great coaches, you know, so like I put greatness under both. After that, uh, nah, Joe was quite vocal. Chuck was. <laughs> 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 and you can hear Joe across the field, you know, Harris, go to the ball! <laughs> right, which I eventually did once, right? <laughs> and, uh, and uh, but two different, you know, two completely different coaching styles. But college and pros are different. You know, you get 18-year-old kids to 22, I mean, that takes, uh, you know, a lot more discipline and focus and and development, you know, and, and, you know, and drive for that. When you get to the pros, they expect you to, you know, be self-motivated and, you know, and all that sort of stuff, even though I think people always need motivation. I mean, that's my feeling, always needs that. But, uh, uh, but no, they were completely different. Joe was a great college coach for me was just fantastic. And, you know, Chuck Noll with with Dick Hoke, who's also very quiet, not like Joe. Uh, you know, so, but greatness in, in those guys. Um, we had a brief discussion about these guys uh, for Canton. Donnie Shell, free agent, South Carolina State. Uh, you talk about guys who could hit, uh, and yet he was a strong safety and actually forced Mike Wagner to move. Uh, and yet he had all those interceptions. Speaking of guys that are Hall of Fame worthy, Donnie Shell certainly falls into that category as well. Absolutely, Donnie Shell falls into that category. I mean, we had a tough defense all the way around. And, uh, you know, we know about Mel Blunt on that corner. Uh, but, you know, people need to start looking at Donnie Shell. I mean, Incredible safety, incredible. Um, not only with interception, but his tackling, uh, you know, his hit to really make it, you know, his tackling and hits really made a difference in games and interceptions, of course. But, but, but he was a force out there and he was a game changer. And, uh, and Donnie Shell absolutely should be in the Hall of Fame. Let's get back to you and your career. About 10 years ago, I guess it was, um, it was an anniversary of the Steelers, I think the 50th anniversary. Um, and we did a program, which was later televised at the Heinz History Center. Um, Mr. Dan Rooney was there and you were there and Bradshaw and Joe Green and Rocky, I believe. And I was fortunate to NC and a bunch of the former players in the front row. And we got around to talking about the Immaculate Reception. And Terry was talking 
and um, in only his inimitable style, he said, tell him what well, you did, Franco. And he revealed that you <laughs> you were in the wrong place. You were in the right place at the right time, but you weren't where you're supposed to be, right? Uh, well, that's true. According to Bradshaw. And, and uh, I mean, that's a true statement. But, uh, uh, but uh, one that you'd have to say that, no, I wasn't in the right place at the right time. But... I wasn't where I was supposed to be, <laughs> you know what I mean? So, uh, uh, and s sometimes circumstances makes you change things. You have to adjust and, and, and you make some moves uh, that, that are not drawn up certain ways. And uh, just like my running style, I'm supposed to be in this hole, but sometimes <laughs> I'm sure you know I'm over in this hole. And uh, and that particular play, well, but, but like first of all, I tell people also that uh, uh, you know Bradshaw loves to throw downfield, right? I mean, short passes to running backs, that kind of he doesn't want he doesn't want to waste his time on that. <laughs> Give me the 40, 50, you know, sixty yard passes. That's what I want. Throw it downfield. Uh, but that particular play, my assignment was blocking you know help my offensive line block didn't work out too well you know what i mean <laughs> <laughs> hey my rookie year <laughs> and uh and and so brad brad is scrambling now right and uh luckily he's strong you know uh, you know agile good athlete you know got away from some tackles and guys hanging on him he's able to you know, and he, you know, he drops back the pass, throw it, throw it. And I say to myself, Franco, be an outlet pass. Okay, maybe he'll throw it to you for, get a first down at least. Uh, but that didn't happen. You know, he threw it downfield to Frenchie and, you know, we all know Jack Tatum and, uh, you know, just uh, incredible safety he is to the way he hits. And him and Frenchie collided and I left the backfield and I remember nothing after that, which is which is quite strange. I mean, my mind is completely blank, and I try to understand it, right? Because when you look at it, and as low as the ball was coming, you know, was coming back, and how low the ball was, no one catches a ball like that. No one in football catches a ball like that. Now, you know, and so when I look at it, and as I said, my mind's completely blank. I see nothing. I hear nothing. Um, but if you look, if you look at the situation, if if I would have hesitated a couple more seconds, probably would have been tackled. Uh, if I would have hit the ground trying to get to the ball, game over. Either way, it's over. You get tackled, uh, or uh, or you die for the ball. Game over, right? I mean, I have no clue. And as I said, if you picture it in your mind, no one catches a ball like that. And uh, and then it surprises me that to keep my balance and to really not break stride. That didn't make sense. And, uh, but the only thing I do remember is stiff arm and Jimmy, uh, Jimmy Warren going into the end zone. And, and like still not grasping everything at that time. You know what I mean? Because, you know, I just remember going into the end zone and I'm not grasping everything at that time. And, and I guess I, you know, will probably say that that play has grown over the years, Stan. What do you think? <laughs> the greatest play in NFL history. It's still described as that. Yeah, and that is so awesome. I mean, that's, you know, so hard to, you know, to put your hands around to say in 100 years of NFL that, uh, 
that one play it was chosen number one. And it is very special, uh, but not just because of that. You know, uh, uh, I think for a number, you know, of reasons where uh, we end up winning the first playoff game ever in a 40-year history of the Steelers. Uh, the story about uh, the Chief, you know, missing it, unfortunately, but he got on the elevator to go down to the locker room to, you know, just, uh, I guess, console us or whatever. And, but as I said, people always called the Steelers, same old Steelers, they always found a way to lose. And I look at it like, wow, okay, now we found a way to win. And, you know, and so when you look at, you know, performance, being able to make plays and all that sort of stuff, when you look at the next f following 40 years, we've had so many guys make so many plays, do so many things, finish it off, and, and whether it's offense or defense, that we found a way to win so many times. And, you know, and, and so is all that part of that? I don't know, you know what I mean? That do you connect all of that that way? You know, like I have no idea, but, um, but we know what, it, what has happened the following 40 years. And, you know, so, uh, but when I look at, 19, you know, like, you know, like we look at the Immaculate Reception, but I look at that whole year in 1972, where you said the talent was there, and you're absolutely right. I mean, the talent was incredible. And, you know, did certain things make it click? Uh, you know, uh, when I mentioned when I got my first touchdown, first 100 yard game, then that's how my thinking got to be. And did that help? I'm sure it helped. You know what I mean? And uh, and then, as you know, the running game got to be pretty good the next few years. And then when they made the rule changes, opened up the passing, Bradshaw really came of age. And I tell people that winning two Super Bowls and before the rule changes and two after the rule changes with basically the same guys, that showed a lot of, uh, you know, how we adjust, who we are as a team, what we were capable of doing, and, uh, and, and really having that type of attitude that, uh, you know, that we want to be the best. You know, we, you know, we want the Super Bowl. And so when I look at, you know, six of my 12 years here going to the championship game, and winning four of those six, you know, I said, wow, that's pretty special, pretty lucky guy. And so, uh, and, you know, so did that play make things happen? Like, I really look at that whole year of 72. I mean, our defense really came of age, too, in 72. I mean, that was, you know, like, I mean, and I love watching those guys. I mean, they inspired me when I watched them. So, uh, just as you mentioned earlier, it all kind of came together. The talent was there. But the most important ingredient of it all, ingredient of it all is winning. Once we started winning, wow, was that something. Well, the Immaculate Reception opened the door to, like you said, 40 years of expected excellence. Um, just a couple more questions for you. Uh, I've heard different things from different players from those teams, and I was around then, as to when you knew that you had a really special group. Some said it was when Chuck said, the best damn football team is right here in this room. Uh, I wonder if you felt like that 
didn't involve a game, was after the Raiders had played Miami uh, and, and they beat them 28-26, I think was the final. It was a great game. And people were calling those the best two teams in football. And Chuck said, I got news for you. The best football team is right in this room. And a lot of players have told me that's when they knew that they had the capacity for being great. Um, well, a lot of our guys talk about that moment of being a fired up moment. And, uh, and like there weren't many of those from Chuck, you know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> and and uh, so like I would say that 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 is that is one and uh but i think each of us each of us start to believe in ourself that uh uh that we're a good football team and that we can go out to oakland and beat oakland in oakland uh and i i have to admit it was uh uh, going out there, I mean, I was really determined and focused that we want to win this football game. And when we were playing the game, even though we were winning in the fourth quarter, I was still nervous and scared. Can we lose the game? You know what I mean? And uh, and it was an interesting feeling that that here we are winning and and uh, still being nervous that we are like just a little ways from the Super Bowl and that was like an unbelievable feeling and you know an, an unbelievable thought who would have thought that the Steelers go to Super Bowl. If you'd have told someone in 1970, Steelers are going to go to Super Bowl and win for it, they would have laughed at you. Biggest joke around. And here we are going to the first. You know, here we are going, we won the game, here we are going to our first one. Now, this is when I said it to myself. And, you know, Chuck said it a week earlier. But I tell people that when we beat Oakland in Oakland in 1974, I knew right then we were the best football team in the league when we beat them in Oakland. And, and, you, you, know, and you hate to say this and feel this way, but I said, it doesn't matter who we face in the Super Bowl, we are now the best team. And, you know, and... And, and that goes a long way. When you feel you're the best, I mean, not cocky. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm not saying, you know, we were full of ourselves cocky. We knew we were good. We knew we were tough. And we knew we could kick anybody's. Last thing for you. As you look back on your football legacy, uh, what do you think will most define it? Will it be being a great running back, being in the Hall of Fame, four Super Bowls, or best known for the immaculate reception. Or all of the above. You know? All of the above. But, but, but you know, uh, when people were telling me that, uh, Franco, you're going to probably go into the Hall of Fame on, on the first round, I'm saying to myself, and, I, and, and, like, I really didn't pay attention to it that much because, you know, like, I've never been, like, driven to be the best running back, you know, have the most yards. And, you know, like I tell people, every year when I went to training camp, my focus was Super Bowl. That's what it was, Super Bowl, you know, that... How do we get to the Super Bowl? And, 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 and that's, like to me, that was the ultimate goal, right? You know, well, individual goals, you know, like I always said, okay, Franco, if you're in the top five in, in our conference, that means you're contributing. 
you know, said, I don't need to be number one. I don't need, you know, it all depends on situations, how much you run. So I said, you know, that's not my drive to focus on me to be number one running back. <clears throat> but being a top five, at least, in your conference, when number one is always go to Super Bowl, go to Super Bowl. And so you talk about, hey, you know, you know, the way my rookie year started, who would have thought that I'd get a rookie of the year? A rookie of the year, you know, nine Pro Bowls, you know, four Super Bowls, uh, you know, you know, man of the year. Uh, you know, you have all those things, and I'm saying, Hall of Fame, you know, what, nothing can top what we had during the 70s. It was incredible run. We set new standards in so many ways, had an incredible bunch of guys. Uh, it was fun. And, you know, we were, it was just great. And I said, nothing would be greater than that. Well, I have to admit there was one thing greater than it all. And that was putting on this jacket. You know, uh, like I said, you know, this jacket to me when it was interesting because I didn't feel that way until I put this jacket on. While I was there before that, it was, yeah, yeah, you know, it's, you know, as I said, it just can't be great what we had. It was unbelievable. But when I put this jacket on, it was like the whole history of football was engulfed in this jacket. From every little kid that started eight years old or in ninth grade or whatever in high school, that every little kid that put this, you know, started football was like in this jacket. It was like, wow, man, that's pretty powerful. And I just felt like all that power, you know, from all the tens of millions of people, like, I said, wow. This is what it's about, you know, that type of feeling where, where it all came together, you know, and uh, so it was a pretty awesome feeling. Thanks, Franco. It was excellent. Always nice seeing you, Stan. It's great. Good to see you. Good Pleasure to see you. Good to be with you. Thank you.